no one was better at kind of slipping the, a slider by an unsuspecting lay audience than Stephen because he was so charismatic, he was so brilliant, and he was so accomplished and such a brilliant writer. I started reading A Brief History of Time in 1988 when I was a teenager, you know, and, and I stopped reading it in 1988. And then I picked it up again in uh, 2020. And, uh, and, and I started reading and I finished it and found it, you know, oh, well, these objections are trivial. So I was like, congratulating my, you know, all it took is becoming, yeah. you know, a full professor of physics. Uh, but he's actually a wonderful writer. And, uh, but the sophistication needed to understand, uh, it's far beyond the fact that he would say things that, uh, such as any equation in your book cuts the readership by half, but any mention of God doubles the amount of readers for the book. <laughs> uh, and of course, I, I, I only later came to the conclusion of what he was doing uh, was really a sleight of hand. And it was, um, I believe, somewhat dis dishonest, perhaps intellectually, to do what he did. And I can say this because... Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect that you would say it, although you hint strongly at it. But you're too much of a gentleman to mention it and speak ill of the dead. I, I love Stephen. The problem I have with him is that he would use, in a brief history of time, this Hawking Hartle cosmology, as a way to obviate the need for a creator. As he said, if God has two roles, according to Stephen Hawking, who was not a great theologian, although I point out that he thought so much about God that he actually was an Israelite because the word Israel in Hebrew means wrestles or struggles with God, and nobody struggled more with God than Stephen Hawking. Uh, and in fact, the last word uh, words of his book, that famous book, probably one of the most popular science books in history, sold three times more copies, as you point out, than Richard Dawkins' Blind Watchmaker or The God Delusion. Uh, it sold over 10, maybe 12 million copies to date now. Uh, Both the last are bestsellers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was. And it made a whole publishing company and a whole industry of popular science writing, which I benefit to this day. So at the risk of, you know, uh, uh, of killing the, uh, the golden goose, I, I would say, you know, he in that book, the final three words are mind of God. In other words, if this is proven to be true, uh, that uh, in back in 1988, he believed that the Hawking Hartle cosmology would obviate the need for God, because God had two purposes. One was to instantiate the universe, uh, and the other was to instantiate the laws of physics. The latter he disposed of, according to him, in The Grand Design, uh, another book with very strong theistic overtones and atheistic overtones. But speaking of, of uh, A Brief History of Time, in that book, he goes through what I only later really recognized as, uh, you know, after going through graduate school, basically, as he was doing this mathematical trick of transforming time in a calculational sense from proper time, from physical time, which we enjoy and right now, uh, and we can do experiments on and we can observe things like time uh, dilation and other relativistic effects. And he converted it to this imaginary space, which is purely used for mathematical purposes to solve equations which otherwise cannot be solved without these techniques, known officially as wick rotations uh, to the experts playing at home. And then he said, well, it's just a mathematical trick. And then literally, Stephen, a page later, it's, and now we see that there's uh, no boundary to time, and therefore there was no need for a creator. Um, yeah. Speaking harshly, and as I assume, you know, we'll find out when I read uh, the rest of Hawking Hawking, which talks about him as a commercial entity, uh, and, uh, but he was not immune to using God as leverage to, infl to increase the uh, influence of his books and his thoughts. In that book, that, that, that argument is really falling on deaf, ear, deaf ears. And worse than that, Stephen, maybe you would comment on this, is that in the uh, revised updated edition in 2016, he not only says that uh, the more, you know, there's more evidence than ever for the no, no boundary theorem, uh, but there's also evidence, more evidence for M theory and inflation. And I point out, this is two years after the Bicep 2 affair that I play a, a big role in. So you do indeed. Yeah. What, ab yeah. <laughs> what about this need to to have vindication, to have proof, et cetera? Why do why do you know sort of these uh, the headlines you know appear on page one? God is dead. There's no God. Hawking says, and then the re response to the community falls on deaf ears, if at all, on page B seventeen of the of the Saturday edition. Well, that was one of the things that I mean, you mentioned, Lawrence, uh, the uh, class a minute ago, and I'm indebted to him for. Uh, getting me into this uh, whole subject of quantum cosmology, I'd been I'd been studying it a bit, but in prepping for a debate, I read his popular book, and then that took me to Valenkin, and then that got me not only I, I I was fortunate enough to attend the lecture series that uh, Hawking did in preparation of the release of A Brief History of Time when I was a grad student in Cambridge. So I've been aware of this for years, 
But um, uh, the, the, in prepping for a debate with Krauss, I ended up getting into the technical papers on quantum cosmology, and that's reflected in, in the last three chapters of this book. And one of the things that I was shocked to find was that this idea of <clears throat> the, the idea that the Wick rotation that eliminates in, a, in an intermediate step in a longer calculation, the implication of uh, a singularity, but only in the domain of imaginary time or in the complex domain of imaginary numbers. Um, th that, that implication that he drew from that in the brief history of time played absolutely no role in his technical work with Hartle. Mm -hmm. That was something that was purely offered for public consumption. And yet he, as he pointed out in the book itself, uh, the, the idea of imaginary time and the the uh, the depiction of the space time geometry that is possible during that intermediate step in the complex domain has no physical meaning, and yet from that Hawking drew a metaphysical implication, namely that there was not a beginning to the universe, and therefore there was no creator. Uh, but then he acknowledges that when you com complete the, the mathematical manipulation, when things are converted back into the real time in which we live, the singularity reemerges. And this is one of the things that was actually also very interesting is that the singularity is presupposed in all of the quantum cosmological modeling. It, they don't eliminate it. It's only in this popular popular work. And if, if I could just cycle circle back to the your previous very astute question about, well, you know, there's always a new cosmo a cosmology. How can you draw any significant conclusion from the whole, you know, body of work in cosmology when things are constantly changing? One of the things that's that's not changing, it's a constant, is the need to account for the specificity of our universe as we find it. And specificity in mathematical terms is, in a sense, um, it, it, it's a rarity of condition among a vast ensemble of possibilities. And w no matter which cosmology is invoked, there is a need to, there's a, what's called the cosmic winnowing problem. How do you winnow among all those possible ensembles of conditions and, and, and possible states of affairs? How do you account for our universe emerging out of all those mathematical possibilities? And that problem is, is ubiquitous. It cuts across the grain of different cosmological models. You find it in multiverse cosmologies where the multiverse is, is, is invoked, whether it's based on inflationary cosmology or string theory or the combination of the two. So you, you construct a multiverse uh, uh, cosmology to explain the fine tuning. But then it turns out that you need a universe generating mechanism to generate the new universes in the multiverse. And those generating mechanisms themselves require prior fine tuning. So you have the, the need for specificity the condition and it's left unexplained. And the same thing occurred, and th this is what fascinated me in the, co in the cosmological case. You can, you can circumvent the beginning problem, but only at the case of a deeper information problem. You have, to, you have to account for the origin of the specificity that is included in, in, in the case of quantum cosmological models, the universal wave function. So, um, so some of these problems that are necessary to account for the origin of the universe at all, why we have something rather than nothing, and why we have a specified something rather than all the other things that could be, are not eliminated by any cosmological theory, and, in, and, and instead continue to beg the same types of questions, questions about the origin of specificity of information, where in our experience, we know of only one cause for the origin of information, for the origin of specificity in that sense, for the origin of fine tuning, and that, that, that cause is a mind. So there's a kind of incorrigibility of the same type of problems in all the cosmological models. And that's, that's, that's what I meant earlier when I was referring to a kind of, the, the, what I'd done in the book was construct a robust argument, one that was not dependent on one model versus another, but rather upon the need to solve certain basic classes of problems that are only solved in our experience by the, by the postulation of, uh, of mind or intelligence.